You're welcome back. So the outcome of the MMDC announcements was generally calm, but there were pockets of violence, uh, mainly within the heart of Accra and in Treponi. We know three people, 13 people rather, were arrested. Treponi is in the northeast region. Um, also resurrected uh, was the criticism of government over a lack of representation and a commission district for the people of Sal, as well as whether the case for the election of MMDCs on a partisan basis is now, you know, more relevant and stronger than ever. Now, the governing NPP have initiated steps to calm agitated supporters, while some of the disappointed MMDCs have condemned the violence and urged support for those who triumphed. So now let's look at, you know, all these issues relating to the MMDCs. Our guest this morning, we have the Honourable Obi Amwa, Deputy Minister for Local Government. Yes. Good morning, Honourable. Good morning, and thank Jifa. you for making some time for us today. Good morning. Great. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. And good to see you. Yes, you used to be on radio yes. as well. <laughs> okay. uh, we yes. also have Dr. Richard Fiadomo, who is the President of the Chamber of Local Governance, who will join us. And we will also have the NDC's Abraham Amaleba, who is the director of the NDC's legal team, will also speak to the first nominee to be confirmed, uh, Mr. Bismarck Inkum of Gumwa West. But first, let me turn to Honorable Obiyama. So it's really been quite a busy week for you. Certainly. And of course, the media would want to speak to us everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's really hectic. Yeah. You know? It's good. At least we, we discuss these things and get to know what exactly the situation is. Um, of course, everybody was waiting for the announcement. It was a much anticipated Much anticipated. List. Except that there were a few uh, misconceptions. You hear most people saying that uh, it's taking the president nine months to be able to appoint um, the MMDCs. Mm -hmm. That is actually not the situation. Because MMDCs are appointed for four years until they are removed or they die or resign, as provided in the Constitution Article 243. So for the tenure of MMDCs, it's four years. But the president has the right to take them out or they can resign. So most of the MMDCs were really appointed between June and July. So if the president says that um, you should carry on to maybe the tenure is over. Then you cannot say that you should start from January. Unlike um, ministers, those in the executive, uh, which is listed under the Presidential Transition Act, who were supposed to leave office um, literally by midnight since January. So come 7 January, I was no more deputy minister. But for these seas, they could continue because the I have a copy of it here so that we all. Yeah. We have this Presidential Transition Act, um, Act 845. And under the schedule, um, based on Session 14, a list has been provided of those who have to leave office by 7 January. It doesn't include MMDCs. So if you are if you're appointed June 2017 as a chief executive, the president could let you run your full term, and that will be June 2021. So it's after June 2021 that we could say that if your term has ended, the president should replace you or reconfirm you, or as he did, ask that some of them to act to yes, be appointed. Yes, but that is the issue. If you ask some of them to act, then it gives the view that then they are no more in the firm capacity to undertake certain activities they can't take major policy decisions so if i was appointed in june yeah, uh, 2017 and your and term ends, ends in, in june, june 2021 20, yes, yes. I, but yet the president until you are replaced yes or you but are, yet the you president are, writes and says don't take any policy decision well, until not, the not appointments really. are done not really policy decisions, but the point I wanted to make was the fact that we should not start counting from January. Okay. We should look at the specific issues. When did the person come into office? Some May, some June, some July. Mm -hmm. Some even came in 2018, 18, yeah. which means that they had even run their four years. But, so if we put that in context, it will not be 
that the after all, in 2013, President Mahama appointed his MMDCs in July. When he came into office in January, because he was he allowed some of them to run their term. Those who are appointed under Professor Mills. And Professor Mills appointed some of them March, April. By July 2013, President Mahama appointed. These things, we have to find a way of um, streamlining them, streamlining them because um, they seem to be a bit confusing. Yes, but there the are some inconsistencies. But the constitution is very clear that your tenure is four years. Four years. So, irrespective of when you start. Irrespective of when you start. Irrespective of even the president in office. Mm -hmm. Except that the president can remove you. Yes. So, he comes into office and decides that uh, you haven't said four years, but I have the power to remove you and takes you off. Mm -hmm. So, we, if you put that in context. What would be the way to streamline it, as you say? Last week, we had Dr. Fiadomo, and he will join us today. But one of the things he did say was we needed to have proper uh, legislative guidelines yes. that you know, provides guidance in how these things are done. Is that something the local government ministry will be looking at going forward? Well, we have the guidelines in the Presidential Transition Act. The MMDCs are supposed to do their handing over notes with ministers, etc., six months before elections. But when it comes to leaving office, it, it, they are not listed under the schedule as those who should leave by 7 January. Meaning that it's recognized in the Constitution that you can run your full term, just like a member of parliament. Except that ours is guided in a way that... It's uh, coterminous with the president. With the president which is not the case with MMDCs. Mm -hmm. And probably there's a reason for it, because the constitution also says that the elections for um, assemblies should not be at the same time as elections for uh, president and parliamentary candidates. There should be a gap, minimum of six months. So probably there's a reason for it. But what I'm saying is that um, if you look at the act itself, it provides for some of these things. The way forward probably will be election for MDCs. Mm -hmm. That one we know when you were elected and the law will provide for when your term will end. But if you leave it that four years but the president can remove the person before the, the tenure is up, some of these things can happen. And then when there's even no fixed guide, guideline as to who should take charge of the assembly when the tenure ends, then you see that there's a lacuna, there's a gap which has to be filled. So. Obviously, we can still fine tune the legislative. Um, um, Within the legislative context, context that we have now, yes. to at least know that this is the way we We've, should go. Yes. I, I, I think that this is one of the few times, or the first time really, that these issues have been thrown up significantly about the tenure, what it's, the MMDCs are able to do. Part, part of it is lack of understanding of the. the the system, the system the, 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 even how the leg legislation has been couched, part of the problem. You listen to people, you see that they have not taken um, special, you know, made special attention to the legislation. The Presidential Transition Act. Act. Mm -hmm. That is part of the problem. So everybody thought, hey, once the president is, is seen in January, a few months, a few weeks, he should start announcing uh, MMDCs. But he has the leeway to let them run their course. And he has more time to decide who should run the districts. Mm. Now, you talk about the president having some leeway, yeah. and so he should not be in a rush because their term is not coterminous yes. with his. Yes. There's criticism of this recent process yes. that the president has taken his time because he wants to make a case for change a case for change in how MMDCs get into those positions, and right. that is through election. Well, the president, because yes. obviously, yes, he has the right to appoint, yes. he has the right to hire and fire, mm -hmm. but then even if it's three months or four, for a second term, mm -hmm. there's a criticism that that could have been better the, the managed. The president has not hidden his um, agenda as far as it's concerned, MMDC should be elected. Indeed, when... On a partisan we, basis. On a partisan basis, we come there. Yeah. In 2017, he said he thought that was the last time that he was appointing MDCs. He's made it clear that he thinks that the way forward is to get MMDCs elected. But doesn't mean that 
um, is to punish us for not agreeing that they should be elected. So he's also delaying the process. He he opened the space so wide that people even felt that he was being too democratic, in a sense that some places he had 19 persons who had expressed interest in that particular one particular position, and these 19 persons, then guidelines were given that for the regional ministers to receive the applications, they should also have some interaction with them, and then bring the number down to four. So for each um, district, four persons' names were submitted. The president was not obliged to even do that. He could have just sat down and said, this is my list. That's what the Constitution empowers him to do, except that he thought oh, people, people should show interest, and I'm opening it up. And some of the issues we can even look at is if 19 persons applied, and then let's say 15 were cut off. The followers of the 15, we didn't hear anything about being disappointed or being rejected. So if it's cut down to four and one is picked, we don't think the other three should have their followers all over the place, um, creating a lot of um, unnecessary um, tension and sometimes even violence. That, that's one aspect that we have to look at. But we should also look at the fact that this is not the first time this is happening. Oh, certainly. Certainly. Every time the appointments are made, made, people are unhappy, even sometimes for ministerial appointments. Yes. Yes. But particularly for MMDCs, mm -hmm. <laughs> I was going through the archives more or less. And your, your former station, if you allow me to refer yes, to, of to Joy, Joy interviewed a regional chairman in 2013. And the words he used, I, I looked at it, I was amazed that these were based on parochial interests and ethnic interests, considerations, considerations and, and that we should look at it. And I made some quotations here. I couldn't believe it. This has not happened now. But just to let you know that any time there are these appointments and announcements, sometimes all over the country, some people express their disappointment, which is their democratic right. But it should not get to the extent of being violent mm. or breaking the law. If you do that, then it's gone beyond the democracy that you are also preaching. Right. In which case, you, you can be arrested and prosecuted. Okay, so I'll come back to you on uh, two specific cases where there was a claim that those who've emerged as MMDCs in those positions were not even on the short lists so that you can give us a bit more clarity about yeah. that process. But let's see if we can have uh, Dr. Fiadomo, who is the president of the Chamber of Local Governance uh, joining us by uh, audio. Good morning, uh, Dr. Fiadomo. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Good morning. Good, Good morning. morning. Thank you very much. So last week you were here and it was quite a, a hot discussion about the soon-to-be-announced then mm. MMDC's list. Now it's been announced. Generally, it's been calm, but of course, there have been pockets of uh, violence and disagreements. We've seen that in the heart of Accra. We've also seen that in Treponi, in the northeast region. What's been your view looking at the, how the week has gone since the announcements were made and what the reactions have been? Yeah, thank you very much. I think that since the names were announced, of course, there have been pockets of violence, as you have said, and the Deputy Minister rightly said, we will also say that this is the first time that MMDCs have been appointed and there have been pockets of violence. But what happened this time around, which for us is unprecedented, is the, the leakage of the vetting committee's report to the president. And you and I and the public were indeed privy to information that should have been exclusive to the president. So now, technically speaking, whoever leaked that list just tie the hands of the president. But we know that per Article 2431 of Ghana's constitution, it is the president who has the sole prerogative to nominate MMDCs. And even though a president puts in place a committee, there is no law enjoining or trying to ask the president to necessarily go according to the reports that come from the vetting committee. The president can also exercise discretion. And that is why we think that some of this violence were as a result. It was so spontaneous because people were expecting people who have been recommended by the vetting committee to be named by the president, but the president did otherwise. And I must be quick to say that the president has done no wrong in nominating people who were not even part of the vetting process, because it is his prerogative to nominate or appoint MMDC. So yes, 
there has been violence in the past, but the spontaneity with this particular one that we see is because of the leakage earlier of the Virgin Committee's report. You say the president has done no wrong in appointing people who were not on the final vet list. But it raises the question of fairness because some people would have gone through a certain process. I mean, for right or wrong, at least they faced the committee. So if someone was eventually appointed and he or she did not go through that um, review process, I'm just wondering, within the spirit of natural justice, it may not be fair. Yeah, to, to some extent, I agree with you. But constitutionally, it is the president who is mandated to nominate. And the constitution does not talk about any processes leading to the nomination. So it was at the discretion of the president to put in place a vetting committee while vetting was done at the region and also at the, done at the national level. So obviously, like I said the last time, the president has intelligence information which you and I do not have. So even if the vetting committee recommends somebody to be appointed or nominated by the president, the president, I believe, will also do some form of due diligence on the person. And so if national security or BNI seems that this person that has recommended may not be good, ultimately, if he is nominated by the president, I'm sure they will give the president a security advice and he will also act appropriately. But all that we are just saying is that whoever leaked that list technically just try to usurp the powers of the president to nominate MMBCs. And we also know that the president was not enjoined by any law to necessarily go by the committee's report. So yes, we agree, but I do not know the extent to which it, uh, it is widespread where people who did not take part in the vetting process have been nominated, nominated by the president. I do not know the extent to For, it's, it's not widespread. Uh, as far as I know, it's just too instances that are being mentioned for the case of course for the AMA or for Greater Accra and then also for Chiripuni which uh, Honorable Obi Amwa will will answer but one of the things you did mention last week and you took a very strong position on it was the timeline that it has taken for the president to undertake these appointments. And you mentioned nine months uh, last week. Uh, Honorable Boabing Asamoa disagreed that it's about three, four months. But today, Honorable Obiyama, who is the deputy minister for local government, has been also given a different and interesting perspective where he talks about the fact that the roles or the terms of the MMDCs are not coterminous with the president. And that even if he is not fully in office. They remain in office until their term ends. The fact that they may not be allowed to take policy decisions, it's neither here nor there. So they remain in their positions until their term ends, and then he can take his time to make these appointments. And he refers to the Presidential Transition Act that gives that leeway to the president. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, thank you. I think this this has been a, a, a consistent commission coming from the government and will not be grudged them. But as far as we are concerned, and I heard you trying to. Hello, Dr. Fiodomo. Okay, I think we've lost uh, him on audio. We'll get him back, definitely. Uh, but uh, let me come to Honorable Obiyamwa. Very interesting thoughts there yes. from Dr. Fiadomo. Yes. Because he mentions, and I think that's a, a, a good thing Very, for, for mm, debate, yes. about the appointments. Yes. The issue of the leakage of that document. Yes. I understand an investigation is going on. Well, obviously, we, we, we will have to find out um, why that document came out, even though it doesn't mean that I, I confirm that that is the, <laughs> the, the document. That is the document, yes. sure. But with the media more or less um, engage in speculation at a certain point, because different lists came out every time. Different lists were being churned out by various stations at every time. And we were wondering whether these were indeed authentic. authentic. And of course, some of us knew that some of the names that they were putting out were, were not the names to be mentioned. But of course, the prerogative is the president is for him to announce these names. And about those not on Yes, yeah, so we know Accra, list. because this unauthenticated document yes. recommended the AMA chief executive then, 
mm. uh, near Jesua. Yes. But then it was quite a surprise to have another name yes. come through, the Honorable Elizabeth Saki. Yes. Then you had Triponi, mm. where there's been a dispute over wow. even the membership of this individual, wow. yes. the lady, to your party. And mm. so the party grassroots have been quite vehement in their opposition, yes. saying that it's not even whether she was even on the list or not. They don't even believe that she's part of their party. Uh, do you, uh, are you able to clear that up for us? Well, um, you, the reality is that the only appointing authority is the president. He sets up a committee. They only recommend. The, he's, not he's not obliged or bound by Just their like recommendation. Any institution. Even you, your place here, you may set up a committee and the report comes, the person who's supposed to take action on the report may decide that this is not what I want. So, and for others to, the president may even call some persons and tell them that I want you to go and run this district. Even if you haven't shown interest by appearing before my committee, let's discuss it. At the end of the day, the person will be convinced that, okay, if you appoint me, I'll take up the challenge. So, there's something like, having a list. It's unlike, let's say, appointment of ministers, where the constitution says that prior approval from right, parliament. parliament. So we have to appear before and parliament. And then, of course, uh, uh, they man, uh, at, at least 50% mm -hmm. of them must come yes. from parliament. Yes. Yeah. So in that case, you say that your name has been mentioned. You have appeared before parliament. You've been approved. So you will become a minister even though the president can change you anytime. Unlike that one, this one, the president doesn't have any uh, obligation to g g get a list in place. So once you've appeared before a vetting committee, that means that um, those who didn't appear before that committee should not have any chance at all from, from being appointed by the president. Would you say that the president, and I know it may seem unfair to imagine this, but yeah. would it be fair to say that maybe the president may sometimes be informed about some of these agitations. For instance, in Tema, yes. we know that some of the chiefs and peoples were against Mr. one Mr. Boating also uh -huh. in, in the uh, area yeah, yeah. and had insisted the, the that, they, yes, yeah. that they wanted an indigent indigen. to come from there. And this was even prior to really the announcement. I think it was after information seem to suggest, suggest that, that uh, uh, it would not be, the individual being chosen was not, not an indigenous yeah, gang. It was a non-gang. Yes. Yes, the president will have to take into consideration several factors. And some of these things, they, they will weigh on his decision because um, you will not uh, say that he will not look at all these things and think that this is the best uh, position for him and for the country. And as to um, chiefs come in. So a lot of chiefs would have sent petitions to the president. He may take some, he may not take some. And it's all over the country, not only the TMA situation. So once the decision has been made, the rest is for the assembly to also vote. And if the person secures the two tests and um, um, minimum vote, then the person has been um, endorsed. So what about Treponi? Is, I mean... Well, Treponi... What is coming out is that some persons were claiming that in 2016, the nominee uh, campaigned for a different party, uh, to be precise, NDC. But by 2020, he was actively campaigning for MPP. And they want to know whether within the four years he had changed parties or secured a party card. These things can, can be looked through, can be investigated. But the reality is that this is the name the president has um, announced. And then the rest is to go through the process. If the assembly uh, endorses her, she becomes the chief executive. But the president has every right to say that you, for whatever months you serve, I can change you. Or you stay on for the four years as mandated by the constitution. So some of these things, it cuts across. Sometimes if it, people... If it comes up like this, does the local government ministry get involved in trying to, you know, strip through what is facts, what should be the way forward? 
Well, we all work for the president. And sometimes if he would ask for information, it will not only be from the local government ministry. Um, national security, all those, even the regional ministers may provide the information. By the end of the day, he takes the decision and then we go by it. If for any reason the assembly votes for a number of times and they still don't want the nominee, then the president may be convinced that he should appoint yes, or nominate a new person. Yes, that's if the person fails to go through three times. Not necessarily three times. Um, it's, it's not stated anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's the convention we've come to know. Yeah, so you're talking about convention. We are talking about, about what's in the law. Okay, so <laughs> then hold that thought um, and I'll come to that because. So we there's know a that procedure. So, okay, so hold that thought. We'll come to that because the elections. <laughs> have started but let me take um, <coughs> dr fiadomo yes dr fiadomo sorry you were making the point about the timeline for the nomination of the mmdces uh, until your line broke yeah thank you i was basically saying that it has been the quote from government and government schools person that the delay is not nine months and i heard the minister talk about the fact that the position of the MMDC is not contemporaneous with that of the president. And so clearly, they are not part of the Article 71 office holders. Now, and so what was the basis for the president to write to the MMDC on the 11th of January, asking them to move from substantive position into acting position, where he made direct mm -hmm. reference to the Presidential Transition Act? So what was the purpose for that? So I do not understand why my term of office is not contemporary to that of the president. I have not finished serving my term, like the writers said, all MMDCs are supposed to serve four years. Of course, they can be removed by the president, they can resign or if there's death, or the General Assembly by the test majority president and Putin can also Unfortunately, the line is not our best friend mm. today, so I hope that uh, we can fix that. Um, Honorable Amwa, so the elections of the nominees have started. Yes. Um, what's your outlook for that? Well, a few started yesterday, and so far it's only Yendi that we've heard that the person did not get a minimum yes. to test. Yes. And for other places, the persons have been endorsed. Yes. For some places, 100%. So, Goma West District, well. uh, and then Yaja Dawuni Robert for Gusho. Yes. Yes, they've been confirmed. He has 100%. Yes, in Ashanti region too, we think it's Pima or Yaja, 100%. But most of them will start from Monday. Um, the Electoral Commission has received a program from the regional ministers as to how they want to conduct the elections. So from Monday, most of the assemblies will hold the elections, and we are hopeful that uh, most of them will cross the two tests, except that um, the president has the opportunity to renominate the person if he doesn't get the two tests. Okay, after so the... you were telling me it's not three times. So, yes. Because we, those of us who are, at least have a bit of institutional memory know that sometimes if you don't get the two thirds the third time, then the president has to renominate. Tell us what. It's well, if you look at our model standing orders, one which was made in 2019, we had an earlier one, but the 2019 is a recent model standing orders. And uh, um, order 15, it provides the procedure for approval of nominee of a president. So the first is where the person gets the two tests. The AC will write to the president that these persons have gone through. Where the person gets 50% or more. The, the procedure is that within 10 days, they, they can go for the elections again. And the president doesn't need to say that I've really nominated him within 10 days. But if you read order 7 or, or 15 7, it says any nominee who at any time fails to pull 50% of the votes of the members present and voting may be renominated. On reasonable grounds or may be withdrawn by the president. So it's not automatic, it's not written anywhere that the president 
um, after three times. But it's only uh, reasonable. That especially, you gave it some time. Yes, especially if, let's say, the person pulls 10%. Or when maybe you, the margins are small. Yes. No, I mean, if the person's um, the vote is very low. Low, okay. The president may decide that uh, this person cannot go through. Okay. No matter okay. how many times, times I have to. they contest. Yes. Mm -hmm. So let, let, let me renominate or let me nominate another person. Mm -hmm. But if it's close, the president may say that I'm sure after still talking to the people in the assembly, this person may go through. So let me submit his name again. That is the third time. So as I said, it's not that by the third time the president has to, as you put it, has to means that he's obliged. Mm -hmm. Sha. Sure. But well, this one is may. May. may withdraw or may renominate. That's, mm -hmm. That's how we should look at it. All right. We have on the line now, um, Ms. Honorable Basi Unkum. He is the Gomwa West uh, District Chief Executive. Uh, he joins us on the line. Good morning to you, Honorable Unkum. I can hardly hear you. How are you, sir? I'm good. Great. The, if you can just speak up a little bad. louder. So, you. congratulations are in order. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. So, we are told that uh, you are the you were the first kind of to be approved <coughs> by the Gomwa West Assembly in in line with yeah. all the election yes, in yeah. line with all the processes that have begun, but we know that a lot of it will start on Monday. So first, getting through, was, were you optimistic you were getting through or you had to kind of lobby the assembly members to be sure you would go through? Thank you. Good morning to your listeners. Your listeners and uh, let me first of all express my appreciation to let alone see the president who gave me this opportunity. And let me say that the president in his first term also gave me the same opportunity, and in my own estimation, I think I did a very good job. So okay. I was always expecting that if the criteria for renomination is based on what we have done, then I will not be satisfied, and that is why I am happy that I have been renominated. So I knew this was, was coming, and so I have been working on uh, my confirmation in the past three, four months engaging chiefs, engaging assembly members, engaging other stakeholders, and, and making sure that we, we were good to go as soon as the, 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 the nominations were announced. And so, yes, we were even going to do this on Tuesday, but unfortunately, Tuesday was a holiday, and then we needed to wait and communicate again on Wednesday before we could do it on Thursday. So I was very, very optimistic that the relationship I have kept with my assembly members, the work I have done, and all that, uh, if they were going to be very objective, then they were not going to fail the president by voting against his, his nominee. I was also very optimistic that I was not going to make 100% because I have been in office before, and uh, I have taken decisions, and normally as a leader, you take a decision in the interest of the greater good of the people. And you always have the minority view who will not be happy with you. And so, yes, I knew I was going to sail through, but I also knew I wasn't going to get 100%. So I am very, very much comfortable with the 75% endorsement also. All right. Now, one of the things that people look out for at the local governance level is accountability to the people because there's a view that you're almost uh, really mini presidents in your, in your district. How are you going to ensure that you are truly accountable to the people that you are serving, knowing that there are lots of interest groups. There's the member of parliament, there are the things he wants to do, he or she wants to do as well, and there's the agenda that you're seeking to push through uh, for the president. In fact, that is what I have been doing, to be accountable to the people, also calls for greater engagement with the people, and with stakeholders at a very local level. And, and that is what local government is really, really uh, about. And so uh, almost 
the every quarter of the 78 communities within my jurisdiction. I am able to get it all, I'm able to engage teams, I'm able to engage from the very least to the very highest person in our, our community. So this is what you do. Once you engage them, they have questions, they ask, you also respond to the person. But you don't also have to do direct engagement. That is why the assembly members are also there. Uh, you communicate to the localities also through the assembly members. So yes, uh, that, is, that is what local government is about. So if you ask me, it's just about having the regular encounter with the people, giving them the opportunity to ask questions, giving them the opportunity also to make an input. In fact, in terms of the budget preparation, your budget wouldn't be approved, for example, if the, if the, the people at the very local level are not made to participate in the process. And that is why there is what you call budget hearing. In terms of the preparation of the, the medium-term development plan, you can't do this without engaging the area councils, without engaging our market women, without, without engaging our fishermen, without engaging other interest groups within, within the district. And this is what, what uh, I do. It, it's, my, it's my routine uh, duty. And so uh, that is it. This is how we will be accountable to the people. Now, the, there's the... Um, local government service and they sign a performance contract with our uh, MMDCs. They release. To be very honest with you, I am struggling to hear you. Okay, I'm I'll try. Hard for my end to hear you. All right, I'll try to speak up a bit louder. So I know that the local government service signs a performance contract with the MMDCEs, and it leads to the release of the leak table. The last leak table was released some two or three months ago. Central region was like, what, number four, number five. I know um, your district will have its individual rankings, but looking at the performance contract, um, what is your view about ensuring that you meet those targets? So yes, the, the performance contract, the, the, the KPIs, which is the key performance indicators, are also taken from our own budget. So to ensure that you hit the target, is to operationalize your budget with the timelines that you have granted. And once you are able to, able to do that, then you are likely to achieve your target. Let me say that when I assumed office as district chief executive, for example, the same district league table at the time we have 215 metropolitan municipal and district assemblies. Gumoros was occupying the bottom, the, the bottom. That is 216 out of 216. If you look at the recent one that was released, we have climbed up the ladder to 147. Obviously, there are things that we are doing well. If you take education, for example, uh, in 2014, the, at a basic level, the pass rate was uh, 30, 35%. 2015, pass rate was 37%. And then in 2016, we did quite well. Pass rate was 52%. In the last four years, we have grown the pass rate now to almost 70%, specifically 69.6. What we are working on is to ensure that in the next four years, we are able to get 90% pass rate. What it then means is that our children who graduate from the basic level, all of them will now have the opportunity to go through the senior high education and indeed to meet the aspiration of his excellency, the president, and as a country that we want everybody to be out of the illiteracy bracket. So this is, for example, what, what we are doing. Uh, for, we also undertook other projects. The attrition rate of teachers in the, in the district was very, very high because this is because teachers were not getting decent accommodation, uh, if they were able to get one, it was difficult for them to have access to bathrooms, it was difficult for them to have access to kitchen. And so you normally find that uh, they will normally try to eat themselves in the, in, the, in the public space, whether push or whatever. So we decided that we were going to have a lot of teachers uh, quarters around the place. So far, in the last four years, we've been able to do about five five or six. The initial plan could only accommodate three teachers. Now we have changed that and it is now accommodating three teachers. So these are the things that we, we have put in place. In terms of water, provision of water, 
we had a whole section of the of the district that struggled to get water involving about 10 communities the, the district assembly raising together with the world bank and the regional coordinating council we were able to provide water to these 10 communities and uh, now thankfully all of them have access to to, to portable water in terms of security in terms of security, our district is rated the best in terms of uh, security in, in the region. So I am quite optimistic that we have done very well and we will continue to do what uh, we need to do. We, we are not perfect yet. There are, there are still room for improvement. And that is what this term goes for us, uh, to take advantage of opportunities available and be able to meet those uh, performance contracts, especially the key performance indicators there is. All right. And thank you very much, uh, Honorable Nkum, for speaking to us. Uh, we wish you all the best in your new role. Thank you. All thank right. you. And it is good to know that as at uh, Thursday, I was the only district chief executive in the country. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. And that's why that's why we, we've spoken you to you this morning, I'm sure. <laughs> will be engaging in the days and months ahead. And that's uh, Honorable Inkum yeah. there. Uh, clearly, he, he yes. seems to understand yes. and, and know his stuff in terms he, he of failed, He failed to inform you that he's the president of NALAG. NALAG, ah, he's the president <laughs> of NALAG. Okay, yes. great. So you're optimistic that a lot of the MMDCs will go through? Yes. Uh, do you have a projection? Are, are you able to anticipate areas where you know that maybe there will be no success and so well, you have plans for that? Well, it's a bit early, but we should also uh, take into consideration the fact that there are some assemblies where the, our friends from the other side dominate. Mm. So sometimes it, it impedes the smooth um, endorsement of some of these um, nominees. Except that some places too, they've come out, even though we appreciate that they dominate assemblies. They've come they, out. They've that, come to generally support yes. whoever has been nominated. Yes. Uh, but it's too early to maybe give you a picture that maybe 80% will go through. Mm. We are hoping, uh, after all, one, two, eight of such persons were re nominated. And we're hoping that um, they are familiar with their assembly members, they know the work they've done, and all things being equal they will give them the pass mark. And um, for the new ones who, who are coming in, um, some are very popular, some people are hailing the appointment by, by the president. So we also believe that they should uh, sail through. Obviously, it will be um, a bit op optimistic to think that every assembly will endorse the- Oh, certainly not all the 260, 60. but maybe you can say what? Maybe 200, <laughs> I don't want, 230. I don't want to be quoted. <laughs> that you come back and say that you, you said 230, 230 and now, yeah, and now, now it's, it's 150. <laughs> I but, that. But they are working. They are appealing to assembly members. They are going to them. And um, the easier ones will be done with within maybe 10 days. Mm -hmm. The more difficult ones, maybe there will be more consultation. consultation before, before the process begins. begins. Just to ensure sure that, that yeah, the go individual through. goes through. Yes. All right, we have some tweets. And when I come back to mm, you, yeah. um, I'll ask you about what the big agenda is going forward for yeah. uh, election of MMDCEs. But let's, let me read some of mm. the tweets that have come through. It says, <coughs> the issues about the rioting NPP folks is about a Didija, meaning some supporters have been left hungry. I'm not a doomsayer, but I can say that we should expect uh, some more of this uh, in the days ahead as effort is made to get approval. That's from Prince Henry in Kofuidua. Farouk from Tamale writes, uh, good morning. It would be good if stakeholders can agree on the election of our MMDCEs to strengthen our democratic dispensation at the local level and to curb the unnecessary agitations among party supporters. Farouk, you didn't say specifically if you were just looking for a general election or the election of MMDCs on partisan basis. Yes. It would be good to hear your view about that. Um, 
Aziz from Wa writes, this disappointment in some parts of the country is a manifestation of the poor governance uh, by the government. Indeed, the rejection of the Yendi MCE shows that the president didn't work with the committee report. And those were some of your messages. Uh, thank you very much. Care to, care to comment on the Yendi MCE rejection? Were, were, are there were any he, peculiarities within that area that meant that the individual not, wouldn't go through? They point to the committee report. Not necessarily. I think he was renominated. Mm -hmm. So he's an incumbent. And for these things, sometimes um, some persons may be dissatisfied with how he ran the place. Some persons will think that he should carry on. And it's gone through the first one. We're hoping that um, he will still do more uh, consultations consultation so, so that, that the second one you know, will yes, go through. Yes, and All that right. should be it. Okay, let's speak to the head of the NDC's legal team, Abraham Amaleba, who joins us live now. Uh, good after, good morning to you, uh, Mr. Maliba. Many thanks for speaking with us. So now that the MMDCs have been appointed and the list has been made public, uh, what does the NDC see as the way ahead in terms of local governance? Good morning, Joshua. Your question is, what, what is the way forward for who? I'm asking, what do you see as the way forward for local governance now that these MMDCs, after quite a long wait, have been appointed? Well, better late than never. Um, this has taken so long in coming. Um, the assemblies were without uh, MMDCs for close to nine months. But, but Honorable, have, Amwa, have, Honorable Amwa has addressed that that their role is not coterminous with the president based on the presidential transition. They have a four-year term, and they were just waiting out their term in as much as they were not taking key policy decisions. They were administering the assemblies nonetheless. Perfect. The government yeah, disputes there, there that position. The uh, general office ended four years. And so you had a situation where uh, those assemblies uh, were without DCEs, and... Um, but why do you say they were without DCs? They were acting. Why do you say they were without DCs? They were acting. No. So they were without DCs. And I saw a statement from the chief of staff saying that some people should continue to act, but they can't take some key policy decisions. And I thought that that was a, a retrogression. And so if you have them now, uh, nominated and they are going through the process, I think that we are getting back to normalization and uh, <laughs> that is uh, power seed. Mm. Now, one of the things being said is uh, the president still has on his plate to try and push through the agenda of the election of MMDCEs. There's a view that this recent uh, appointment process has made stronger the argument that we have the MMDCs elected on a partisan basis so that we don't also see some of the agitations or disagreements. The election will be done. Whoever triumphs comes out of it and we move on. We cannot use the inability of the president to appoint MMDCs as a reason for calling for uh, the politicization of our lower strata of our government. I don't think that the inability or the lack of capacity by the president to do this nomination is enough to then politicize our lower structures. Our lower structures are places that you would expect that you will not politicize those structures. And then at the district level, you have all people, irrespective of political divide, can approve the district assembly for your needs. Now, you have a situation where people are calling for the politicization of that structure. That old lady, who normally would have uh, woken up and go to the district coordinating uh, district coordinate director's office or the planning officer's office to, as it were, have his needs addressed, will now feel that that assembly is an assembly for a certain political party. 
and that when he goes there, he will not be listened to. And so, if it is not broken, why do you fix it? The president's inability, in this case, to do this appointment without any hiccups, was as a result of his own method used in appointing the DCs. The president is the sole appointor of this DCE. The reason for which he has decided to consider a committee to do vetting and interview people and then have those persons who would have performed well sidelined and then new people are brought in is the doing of the president which has resulted into uh, what we are seeing this agitation. But Mr. Once Maliba, I, I think interview. I think it may once, seem once unfair. Go, Hold on, sir. Hold on, sir. Just a quick point. point. It may seem unfair to say that it is the process the president adopted. What's wrong with being consultative? What's wrong with being a bit more thorough than maybe he may have been in the first term? So that's where I'm coming to. If you, Jifa, is called for an interview, and you go for that interview and perform very well to the satisfaction of the interviewer. Now, you, the person who has gone for the interview, would have a legitimate reason to expect that the job will be given to you. You have that legitimate expectation. Particularly when a list has already come out <laughs> indicating that you were the one who was chosen. These people have their followers. Naturally, when the disappointment comes, after you've been selected or you've been selected after the interview, clearly people will vent out their frustration. So I'm saying that it is the modus operandi, the method used. What took the president from saying we have one hundred, we have 250 uh, uh, district assemblies. Each week, we're going to use nine months. And uh, this method I'm, I'm, I'm trying to outline will also not be uh, far from the nine months. We use nine months to do the appointment. What stops him from, say, using each week to deal with, say, 10 yeah. district assemblies? It's not it is to appoint the those people to the assembly. Why would he then constitute a committee? That committee does its work. People have legitimate expectations because they perform well. And this came out, and then you would think that you will not have this agitation. These agitations were brought upon by the president's own method of choosing the assembly, uh, the MMBC. Okay. okay. All right, uh, uh, Honorable yes, I, I need to respond. Yes. I think that uh, my good friend has not really appreciated the issues. For instance, President Muhammad did not appoint any committee as far as we are aware. But there were agitations after he made the announcement. It wasn't based on any list. A whole regional chairman of Greater Accra, Adekuka, said that it was the narrow interest, ethnic base, etc., etc., and that he should look at the list again, and that they have even submitted a, a position to him that he has to That consider. was in 2013. 2013. And was that based on the list? Secondly, he's talking about inability. President Muhammad appointed his... Uh, or nominated the MMDC in July. He was in office in January. Was that inability? When he had taken over from Professor Mills in um, 2012, um, uh, yes, about six months to the lessons. So he should appreciate these things very well before he comes out this way. Otherwise, um, he contradicts himself. Obviously, he's against election of MMDCs. Mm. We can come to that. Yeah. I would state my position strongly. So and we need he, to elect MMDCs. Okay, so he, he talks about the election of MMDCs yes. on a partisan basis yes. being a danger at the local level yes. because as we speak, ordinary people yes. may not feel... As we speak, literally every DC has his political roots. Yeah, some, they have a constituency or a, no, there a are, no, there are some who were party officers who have been nominated to become mm -hmm. chief executives. Are they not partisan? But this situation is only one party. I mean, if you take even my constituency, the, the most interesting thing about it is that the presiding member in the assembly in my constituency 
is the constituency chairman. He won his electoral area elections, came to the assembly, and he was an elected presiding member. He's still the uh, chairman of MPP in the constituency. So, so, your, see, so your view is that a lot of the assembly is constituted by a lot of elected officials yes. at the political party level. Yes. So really, really whether what, you, are we, what are we hiding? So whether we elect on a partisan basis, it doesn't de deviate his from what we have his now. His argument is that the old lady cannot walk to the office of the chief executive because we have been nominated by a party. And, and she then, may not be a member of that party. I'm saying that Isn't even that my, a real danger? No. Even my, my chief executive has been renominated. He was the second vice chairman of the party. And he served four years. And so, he he is, so he's a known party he's individual. He's a known party individual. Does it mean that people don't go to go the to assembly? Him. Or those who go to the assembly are only MPP members. We have to be realistic. All across the world, people vote on partisan lines to elect their chief executives. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the irony is that even the unit committee members are elected. Assembly members are elected, but chief executives are not elected. Now you're saying that if we try to do that on partisan basis, the local governance system will break down. And I'm saying that at the assembly level, everybody knows which party any person belongs to. Mm. Has it broken out local governance system? All right, just a quick uh, response from Honorable, uh, from Abraham Ambaleba. So Abraham, is it that the NDC is worried that this is like the last thing in the whole local governance yeah. setup that was put in place by, by the NDC yeah, and maybe. you don't want to lose that? Maybe that's why yeah. members of the NDC are opposed to having elections at a partisan uh, status at that, that local level. We think that the current arrangement has served us well, where at the local level we are all united <laughs> and that people don't see themselves when they go to the assembly as an NDC woman has come. Uh, this is the woman sitting at the reception of the NDC woman. You don't hear those things. But you, do, you may you not know, hear it, but the, know, the individuals know, leading these assemblies are, are known party to individuals. Go to, the, to go to the district assemblies because, yes, the person there is, uh, is, is, is voted for on partisan basis. I am saying that we all know each other's uh, party affiliations. I'm sure there's somebody who knows Jim Mensah's party affiliation. But because it is not done in the open, that's a difference. Because it is not done in the open, and because the person who is uh, occupying the seat was not there based on open partisan election, he feels a certain sense of responsibility towards all and sundry. And so he does not see his being in that office uh, 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 being tied to his, uh, his party affiliation. And so his sense of responsibility is to the entire people in the community and uh, for that matter the district that is where the argument is coming from but on but, 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 but mr maliba mr That's maliba mr maliba we have members of parliament you may be in an area where it is you know an npp member of parliament if i have an issue nothing stops me from calling the individual yeah. the individual is my member of parliament oh. he's responsible to me as per holding that role so yeah. It then questions the argument you're putting forward. Certainly. You've made my case. That is me. not true. That is not entirely true. That members of parliament, uh, the constituents, who are openly identified with one political party, easily are comfortable walking to the member of parliament who doesn't belong to their political party. You've not, you've not found out how people feel uncomfortable doing that. So, so In any case, the district assembly... <laughs> The assembly members will tell you when you ask them, are you an NDC assembly member or an MPP assembly member? You know their response. They always say that I am here for all and sundry. That is the spirit. That is what we are talking about. At the lower level, you do not politicize it. And you realize that it wasn't the MDC alone that was against it. Chiefs, National House of Chiefs, who are in the community of the people bought into the same argument and said, no, this has served us well. Why are we interested in politicizing every structure of our government? And okay. for that matter, there shouldn't be elections based on a partisan basis 
at the digital level. Was it only the NDC? So I think that if we think that we want to do some elections at the digital level, we can still do it, but not on partisan basis. We All can right. still have people independently coming out to give up them, give themselves up for elections, and people can vote for them. But to make it partisan is where I have a problem. All right. Thank you very much, Abraham Amaleba, uh, Director of Legal Affairs for the NDC. Well, yes, well, quick well, one, well, Honorable. Then we take a break and then we come Very well. Back. He's, he's made his points, except that I don't agree with him. Mm -hmm. Even if you say at the lower level we should not politicize the system. I'm a member of parliament. I belong to the lower level. I have to deal with them every day. Once I'm able to get there, I have to deal with them. I'm at the lower level. So people Everybody come to you. It doesn't yes. matter whether no, they are. You'll be surprised how I even engage the NDC persons. Some some of them, maybe office holders, mm -hmm. and then those down. And in any case, if I lobby for a road to be made, is it made for only MPP people? If I lobby for a school to be built or a clinic, whatever, it's for the general community. Do I say that, that those holding MPP cars are the ones who should who should uh, patronize or who should have access to their facility? <laughs> it's for everybody. So if you think that because I have been elected on a ticket of MPP, everything I do will it's serve for MPP. MPP. People. Yeah, I mean it means it's a misconception. Mm -hmm. You are not appreciating the issue very well. Mm -hmm. It's the same way that if a, a DC who has been elected knows that in the next four years he will go for elections again. He will not say that I'm only looking at MPP people. Because it's not only MPP people who vote for him come the elections. And I, how are you going to run your district if you think that you can go it this way? It's rather when you are appointed that you think that you owe your appointment, your everything, to the appointing authority. And in which case, they may complain, they may write petitions. If and, the you president, don't, and you are not obliged to really do anything yes. about it. If the president says, and this is the person I want, what happens to the electorate? Mm -hmm. But here is a situation where he has to account to the electorate because they will vote for him. And there's no way any person is going to say that uh, I only concentrate on this side because uh, they are the only ones who are going to vote. Everybody will vote. And you want the highest votes as much as possible. We will not say that uh, once I get 49%, I'm okay. So he has to appreciate these things. I mean, so, at the end so, of the day... But strongly, will the president push further? Because I think now the argument... Has become has been resurrected, and many are thinking maybe we have to fix this soon. Yes, as far as we, uh, the ministry, are concerned, we went very far, based on the instructions of the president, um, to get MMDC selected. To the extent that EC submitted CI to Parliament for a referendum on this matter, and it was passed. And so at the last moment, when our friends had their major press conference. And more or less mm -hmm. telling their followers that um, go and vote against it. it. Then the president said we should build consensus. Okay. So will you tr are you trying to do that again? Will you try we, we, and do we that? We put it on the table we'll again. Put it on the table um, again. Indeed, we are asking the major stakeholders to bring their position paper. As far as we are concerned, we've done enough consultation and everything. The records show. We consulted Christian Council, uh, Muslim Association, the parties, etc. So now they should be in their former positions. He referred to the chiefs. The chiefs were rather worried that if we scrap the appointment system, we scrap the government appointees in the assembly, that means that they may not have a say or a nominee in the assembly. Because based on the 30% representation, they chiefs are chiefs. Get a role. Yes. yes. That is what was the So that's major something to look at to look going at. forward. Because their, their, their position was are you scrapping that 30% uh, appoint, appointee system? If you are scrapping it, how do we get involved in the system? Mm. It's something that we really need to look at. So there's still work to do, but I think that eventually he ended up by saying that. We should do the elections, but it should not be partisan. It should be independent. Okay. All right, so the, the jury is still out on that. We take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll talk a bit <coughs> about Sal.
the occasion. With ATL, you can never be out of style. ATL, bringing fabric to life. As young girls, we had dreams. Dreams to be a star, dreams to stand tall amongst our peers, and dreams to be Ghana's most beautiful. Here we are as young girls, evolved into ladies and serving as role models to many. It has been a long journey from the audition stages through to the live performances and eviction shows. We must say it's been such an experience. From the low moments and the high moments, we have enjoyed every bit of this learning and care. From 16 down to six of us, the time for one of us to wear that prestigious crown is here and we are super excited. It is the grand finale of Ghana's Most Beautiful 2021, the most anticipated finale. And I can say that the ladies and I are super ready. Yes, they are. Six beautiful, confident and smart ladies, poised and ready for this year's Ghana's Most Beautiful finale. Come see your ladies battle it out for the crown, the car and a life of luxury and fame. Join us at the National Theatre of Ghana on the 3rd of October 2021 at 8 p.m. sharp. Tickets are going for 50 Ghana cities. It's an all-ladies affair as we have four of Ghana's sung birds, Abiana, Sinoso, Sefa and Adina. Don't miss this spectacular night with amazing music and dazzling performances from our final six ladies. Push your favorite to be crowned by dialing star 713 star 13 hush or download the TV3 reality app on Google Play Store or Apple Store now and vote. Ghana's most beautiful. Rediscovering true beauty. And sponsored by Lavon's Tomato Mix, Camel now from Kerex, Freedom from Casa Precum, GTP, Darling Lemon Drink, Airtel Tigo's Big Time Bundles, Blue Fart, Deluxe Acrylic Paint, Heaven Black Mosquito Spray and Coil, and Napa Mackerel. Geisha, close up. Ayo Insurance, Fun Milk Nutri Day Yogurt, and supported by. You're welcome back. And some of you have sent your messages. Let's take a look at them. Uh, this one says, the general silence in Ghana upon the announcement of the MMDCEs is an indication that His Excellency the President is a man of wisdom. And that's from Suleimana uh, Damba from Tamale. Uh, this one from Johnny at Sunyai says, I disagree with Honorable Amwa that the MMDCEs should continue to be in of, uh, continue to be in office because they were not appointed in January like the president. So is he telling us that if the government is out of power, the MMDCs will continue to be in office until a new government is put in place? Well, Johnny, that happened in the case of the NDC when Professor Mills uh, came to office. So it's not exactly unusual that they would continue in their role until things change. Uh, this one from Ismaila Ali says, please ask the honorable member, uh, then why tell the MMDCs uh, to act if their tenure has not ended? I think that issue hasn't been cleared up. Can you quickly clear that up? Well, as far as I'm concerned, the chief of staff, one was reminding them that you are still in office. Two, the president has had his second term. He's still arranging his um, executive. So once you're there, you don't even have a minister. So don't take decision, policy decisions. And I think that is but fair. Were they able to take financial decisions, for instance, spending? Because of, that was also course. a criticism that the no, releases had read, not come. If she quoted 14.5. Um, and 14.5 is talking about policy. It says, before the assumption of office of the incoming minister, a person so appointed by the president shall be in charge of the relevant ministry but shall not take a decision involving a policy issue except the Ministry of Justice where the Solicitor General shall be in charge of the ministry. That's what she, she quoted. More or less saying that even your minister who is acting now, um, not knowing whether he will be the one to be nominated, has been asked not to take policy decisions. So you 
at the district level, you can run the place because your time is not up, but you don't have to take policy decisions as required under the Presidential uh, Transition Act. That's how I see it. Mm -hmm. You will be surprised in May, in May, the news came out that they, all of them have been asked to go home. It took the regional minister, Geta Akra, to make a public uh, statement that indeed nobody has been asked to go home. They have to stay on based on the president's directives. So people should just look at these things very critically. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people hear others saying it. And then, then they, they latch on to it. Yes. All right. Yes. Um, this one from Kwame says, the non-partisan nature of the district assemblies has some good in it. During the last district assembly elections in my constituency, Dom Kwabenya, mm -hmm. our electoral area, a typical NPP-dominated area, mm -hmm. the electorate voted overwhelmingly for an individual who is a known NDC constituency executive. Mm -hmm. If it were strictly partisan, mm -hmm. uh, a strictly partisan affair who would never have won. But but if the area is dominated by MPP and the NDC person wins, it's not strange, except that he has to work with the MPP people. Mm -hmm. You understand? Yes, but if Which, we have a partisan situation, this that opportunity may not be there. That he cannot work with the other no, people. No, that he may not even be elected. Because, of course, he's the yes. majority. He's the majority. Will and I, and I think that's the concern because in, if it happens like this in a place like Don Kwabi, and I live mm. in that constituency, mm. it's very MPP. Yeah. But if but, the, but the presiding you, member is an known NDC person, it allows for the collaborations that typically we would I, not I see. I also live in Domi Kwabinya, Parako Estates. Mm. Uh, if you're talking about letter area basis, mm. there may be a letter area which is NDC dominated. But the whole constituency may be MPP uh, mm -hmm. biased. Mm -hmm. But okay. some letter areas, areas may, may be NDC dominated. And there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. um, if you think that that is a virtue, if you think that that is something that is positive about it, fine, why not? Mm -hmm. We can discuss it. That's why I'm saying that some people think that for the unit committees and the assembly members, we can still let it look, let it look. <laughs> Non-partisan, because as far as I'm concerned, they are it's, partisan. It's, it's partisan. Okay, you you were telling me that maybe an approach we could adopt just yes. to start on a certain path right. would yes. be election of the mayors for the big cities. Yes, um, so that people will know that I mean it's nothing strange and mysterious in the sense that if let's say AME is is headed by a person who's uh, government is not in power, he can still run the place. And people should cooperate with him if they think that he's doing a good job. And for, for politics, I see it as power sharing. Not winner takes all that we are all complaining about. President sits in his office, he announces 260. I mean, whether you like it or not, almost 100%. Belong to his party. Now he opens his up, others come in. He's power sharing. Whether you are in power or out of power, you are also helping running government. And people will even see whether you, you keep up of delivering. Because stock is cheap. If at the end of the day uh, you are running who, and you run it very well, everybody knows that, yes. And even out of power, see how the person is running, running the place. Mm. And, and you will not come giving excuses that this government which is sabotaging you, that's why you are not delivering. Your skills will show. And if it comes to common fund, <laughs> you have to. Everybody qualifies. You don't say that uh, because it's the uh, enclave of the opposition, I'm not sending common fund there. As we speak now, if you go to places where MPP doesn't dominate, the districts are headed by MPP persons. And some of them, they've run them very well. The world has not come to an end. So we should appreciate some of these things. And as you rightly said, if we think going wholesale um, will make people apprehensive. You might as well start on a smaller scale. The mayors, big cities, big towns. Let's all agree. Search places. Let's do the elections. And then see how, how it Except goes. Except that our, our friends will complain. <laughs> Almost all the big cities will be dominated by, by MPP. MPP people. <laughs> so, um, before we wrap up, sir, yeah. we need to talk about Sal, that uh, <laughs> Santo Kofi Akpapu Lipe uh, Lolobi. Yes. Now, it's emerged that they have an assembly, yes. but it's not been 
Comms fully uh, commissioned, yes. and then the, there remains the issue of them not having representation in Parliament. Please clear up for us. Yes, from you, you have become a chief advocate for local governors. I'm really impressed today. <laughs> Some of your sound bites, <laughs> I wish I could even <laughs> recollect them and then use them very well. Probably I'll ask for the tip and then pick some of your sound bites. Mm, thank you, but sir. But I would advise that as much as possible, we should not refer to Sal again. It's now Guan District. It's now Guan District. It's one Guan District. So but, let's but, they are, but the constituency, the parliamentary constituency doesn't sit there, does it? No. There's, there's, it's complicated. Yes. Um, a bit complicated, I agree with you. With the creation of a new region, um, the letter areas fell under OT. And then, so they were also under Jassican. We had a Jassican district where those who are now Guan districts, 13 letter areas, they were part of Jassican. So Jassican was 33 letter areas, 13 were taken out to form the Guan district. You understand? So we went through the motions, parliamentary motions, LI, EI by the president in September, LI was sent to parliament in October. By 9th November, the LI had matured, so we now had Guan District. Mm -hmm. Now, during President Kufado's first term, he's created a lot of districts, but he has been very careful not to create a district which would push the AC to create a consistency. None, except the Guan district. The moment he created the Guan district, means he had separated Jassican. He has taken some electoral areas from Jassican to form the Guan district. And because they also needed an MP to represent them, it meant that the EC would create a constituency for them. Unfortunately, by the time the creation of a district matured in November, that was the day that, that was the day Parliament was rising mm -hmm. to go and campaign. So EC could not create a constituency before the elections. Mm -hmm. In their own wisdom, then they said, then you should vote for presidential, but don't vote for parliamentary. Mm -hmm. It has its implications. But that's the EC side of it. Mm -hmm. I remember very well after elections, the EC attempted to bring um, a CI to Parliament to create Guan constituency. Some of us do the attention to the fact that when you bring an instrument to Parliament, it takes 21 sitting days. The number of days that we have before 7 January, we will not have the 21 sitting days. And whatever you do by 7 January, what you've submitted will be we null and void. void. So it has to be resubmitted to in be the resubmitted new Parliament. In the new Parliament. And is that, is that on course? So let me tackle the aspect of Guan District so really fully in place. Okay. We have the Guan District, we have the letter. Uh, I understand area, the assembly, assembly members. members, yes. But there should be government appointees. Mm -hmm. The president should also put in the 30% as required. And then nominate a chief executive who will then be endorsed by the assembly. And once the list has come, we expect this one to also happen. But the minister, if you heard him, he is more interested in the structures. Send people there, local government service, post people there. Where would the office be? Where would the departments be? As we wait for the president to make the announcement. Because it's the same people who say that, ah, you have announced chief executive, he doesn't have a place to sit. You have announced chief executive, he doesn't have a place to sit. You have announced an assembly, you have inaugurated an assembly, there are no staff members. So, all so, so, so for you at local cup, it's more about having the structures in, in place, place before the formal ceremony of yes. announcement and inauguration yes. and everything. Yes. Otherwise, I mean, we, we, but we have to now resubmit the instrument for the constituency well, to the, the it's, house it's, later. It's for the EC to decide to, when. It's for EC to submit it. But if you look at decided cases, if you create a constituency. Uh, Within a term, it takes effect from the next term. Mm. So it makes no sense to submit it now. Well, whatever time EC will submit it, it will go to the 21 16 days if two tests don't um, reject it. But you then say that you created the Guan constituency, assuming they want to name it Guan. Mm. But the Guan constituency can only take effect from the 2025. And that's what the Supreme Court has said. And so it, it makes sense. Based on the decided precedence. Yes, we've the had. cases. 
It makes sense. Otherwise, a government comes into power, finds a way to create more consequences if it thinks that it's they not... They need to show up yes. their base. Okay. So, yeah. so this just really to avoid yes. the perception of gerrymandering yes. as well. Otherwise, you, you, if you, if the court decides today that AC can create Guan consequences and it should take effect, mm -hmm. the government may end up creating more distress, which will push EC to create more consequences. And it, it, it will be gerrymandering. All right. That's why the Supreme Court in this wisdom has said that if we interpret the constitution, because it happened in 2012. 45 uh, constituencies, New constituencies were and created were in March. And there were accusations that... No, the no they were created in March. Yeah. So, for instance, I was MP for a brief in someone constituency. And that was divided. It was divided. Mm -hmm. So, in someone more or less, they didn't have an MP. Because I chose to be uh, a brief. Mm -hmm. In some more or less, until we went for the elections in 2012, December, from March to December, you couldn't say that I represented the two districts. Mm -hmm. But that's what we lived with. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately that for the Guan state, it may have to go longer. By the end of the day, EC can decide when to create that constituency. Right? It will take effect in, in 2025. Yeah. Right. But for the district, um, the minister has assured the whole country that in the next few weeks, he wants everything to be in place. He sent a team, he brought him a report where we should spend. We had meetings with the Office of Local Government Service and they are posting persons there. And when he says that assembly has been inaugurated, we will have their departments, they have their chief executive, they have their assembly members all playing their part.